Ugh, stress is the bane of my existence. (laughs) On a personal level, I'm always trying to manage it because I like to do a lot of things. (laughs) One thing finishes and I'm already on to the next. I have big dreams and big ideas and I like to learn and grow, which means that life definitely feels interesting and exciting more than it would otherwise. But I also often feel like I'm figuring stuff out instead of feeling like, I already have things figured out. Is that even a thing? I guess some people do have things figured out for a while at least. On a professional level, when I was in healthcare, I would see patient after patient and almost every single one of them was weighed down by stress in a way that was impacting their health, whether their energy or hormones or mental health, physical health. So managing stress is the thing that is very high on my list of priorities. It feels like almost always. And I'm always thinking of ways to address it because, you know, life, (laughs) we can't always be meditating or going for walks or doing all the things that we want to do or that we know we should do to feel calm. But then I started thinking of stress in a different way. Usually we think of stress as acute or chronic, meaning is the stress short-term or acute? Let's say you have a deadline or you're stuck in traffic or you have an argument with someone, or is it long-term chronic? Like you're caring for someone who's sick, like a sick relative, let's say, or you have ongoing financial struggles or a high pressure job. And of course, The lines are blurry because if you have a difficult relationship with your spouse, then you might get into more arguments. Or if you commute to work, you might get stuck in traffic on a more regular basis. But let's leave the definitions for a second, just understanding that typically we think about stress in terms of short-term, acute, or long-term, chronic. Recently, I started thinking about stress not just in terms of the actual stress, the thing that's causing the stress and managing the stress for however long it lasts, but instead how I can understand and manage my threshold for stress. And this leads me to the concept of ambient stress. I think that knowing your ambient stress level can actually help you manage both acute and chronic stressors better. Welcome to the XO Conversations Podcast. I'm your host, Rishma Walji. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. And if you're already a fan, I appreciate you. And I am so glad you're here. On this podcast, we explore topics related to identity, personal growth, and awareness, all in the pursuit of living our own XO extraordinary lives. If you know me, my goal for each podcast is to help you think differently about the subject, hopefully have an aha moment, if you will, and give you some tools or ideas to make changes, big or small, in your own life. One of my more popular resources is my free workshop on emotional regulation. You can get it on the website at livingxo.com slash emotions. Let's take the example of ambient sound. If you're somewhere, let's say at home or in the office, you might hear some minimal ambient noise, the heater, the buzz of your appliances. And then when you go out in the world, let's say you're at a grocery store or a mall, you might hear more noise. It's the background noise of people talking or people pushing carts around. Now imagine you're at a nightclub or a noisy restaurant. The music is louder, the people are talking louder, and it becomes harder to hear yourself or others. Now let's think of this ambient noise in terms of thresholds. How much noise can you handle at any given moment? For me, for example, I love listening to music when I'm cooking or even in the background when we're having dinner together as a family. But when I'm working and thinking and writing, 
I need to have quiet. So my threshold for ambient noise is lower. Now let's take stress and look at it in a similar way. First, we need to understand that when we look at stress, what it actually is, we tend to think of it as anything that gets us to feel worked up or let's say feeling worried or overly busy. But in fact, stress is your body's response to a threat. So for example, if you're in a jungle being chased by a tiger, you have a threat. You want to survive, so your body increases your heart rate and your blood pressure and your breathing so that you can run away and survive. You might have heard of this as a sympathetic nervous system response. Of course, there's some more complexity to it, but for our purposes, just understand that what we think of as stress isn't necessarily how your body is thinking of stress. Your body is reacting as if it's under attack. It's not like you have different responses for different types of stressors. If you're in a jungle and you see a tiger, you respond in a certain way. And also, a deadline is a tiger. A loud noise is a tiger. An argument is a tiger. Now, in theory, when the stress finishes, the tiger is gone, and you go back to what's called a parasympathetic state, where you can relax and stop and go to the bathroom and sleep and rest. So when you're under attack, your body needs to divert resources to certain organs so that you can get away. And your digestive system is not a priority, which is why, by the way, so many people who are constantly under stress have trouble with constipation. The point is that our bodies are built to handle short-term stress. Be in the jungle, run away from the tiger. But at some point, we need to take a break. We need to find shelter from the tiger and recover and recuperate. This is why chronic stress is so hard on us. We don't get a break. It taxes our bodies in so many ways. And it eventually contributes to illnesses because we can't keep up this response indefinitely. Now, when I think of ambient stress, think of it as the stress that's around you all the time, like ambient noise. You're bombarded by negative news stories. You're dealing with text messages or emails of urgent work things. Maybe you're moving, so you're living out of boxes all the time and you can't find anything. You're feeling disorganized. Or you don't sleep well, which is also a stressor for your body. And the list can go on and on. Think of ambient stress as something that might be chronic, or negative, probably not urgent, but you notice it and it's sort of always in the background. I suppose it might overlap with chronic stress, but to me, when I think of this term ambient stress, it makes a lot more sense because there are things in life, let's say having kids. I don't think of having kids as stressful necessarily. I mean, parenting certainly can be stressful for sure, but there is more ambient stress in my day because I'm a parent. I'm thinking about my kids. I'm worrying about them. I'm busy with them. I'm driving them around. I'm signing forms. There's more on my plate, so to speak. So there's ambient stress. It's different than when I didn't have kids. And this makes sense to me physiologically because I don't know if you've experienced this, but for me, even though my kids are teenagers now, when I'm not in the same house as them, like if I'm traveling or they're sleeping over at someone's house, somehow, I don't know, I just sleep better. I'm able to sleep in. Whereas when they're at home, it's like some part of my mind is just thinking about them all the time. Even if they're fast asleep, I can't control it. It's like I sleep with one ear open. I don't know. I'm expecting something to happen. It's not what I would think of as acute stress or chronic stress, but it is ambient. And this concept of ambient stress has changed so much for me. It's changed how I decide my schedule, where I place my boundaries, what I agree to, because I know if my ambient stress levels go up when I'm busy, when my kids are stressed, when I'm organizing an event, then my threshold for additional stress, no matter what it is, is lower. I'm more likely to crash or get overwhelmed if one more thing happens because it can tip me over the edge. 
So now I will plan some time off during a busy season so I don't overcommit. I'll plan a date with my husband if one of us is traveling for work because in our relationship, that disconnection in our marriage, it causes ambient stress. So we need to find time to connect. I will prioritize my sleep when I know I have a bunch of late nights in a row. Sleep is really important for me. (laughs) My sister-in-law teases me that if I'm up too late, I'll turn into a pumpkin because I may or may not have dozed off on the sofa, (laughs) possibly mid-conversation when we hang out late at night, more than once. (laughs) Let me give you some other examples. If you're a teacher, there might be additional things to do at certain times of year. Some of them might be stressful, but some of them might just be things that you might not call stress, but you feel them because they're around. That would be ambient stress. Let's say it's in June when school is wrapping up for the year. At least here, that's when it when it wraps up. So during that time, if you're expecting that time of year to be busier, perhaps your threshold for stress will be lower and you might need more quiet time or downtime. Maybe you have chronic pain or recurring pain. Like let's say you have a very heavy, painful period, or you have a sprained ankle, something like that. That will add stress to your life and lower your threshold for more stress because it's harder to add one more thing. Maybe you struggle with anxiety or depression and A lot of people wouldn't classify that as stress necessarily, but in my mind, it counts because it certainly lowers your threshold and it's harder to take on more things or manage more stress. I'll just end here by saying that in my practice, when I would see patients, I noticed that when people had high levels of stress and not enough, let's call it rest or reprieve from stress, Then at some point when that threshold was crossed, let's say something big happens, a family member gets sick or there's a big flood in their house or someone passes away, something intense that they have to deal with, but they no longer have any reserve energy for that stressor. So many times they would end up with a major diagnosis after that, diabetes, lupus, or a number of other autoimmune and inflammatory conditions. So my questions to you are, what is your ambient stress level? How close are you to your maximum threshold? And how can you not only reduce your stress, but also improve your threshold and your ability to manage additional stress, whether planned or unexpected, based on your ambient stress levels? I would love to hear your aha moments from this episode or any other episode for that matter. You can write a review on iTunes. Oh my gosh, I love to read the reviews. Or you can message me directly. You can send me an email at hello at livingxo.com. Hearing from you is honestly the best part of doing this. So please do connect. Thank you so much for joining me. Take good care. Until next time. Thank you.